Hey folks, thanks for taking a little extra time out here so that we can keep you guys on schedule with everybody else and make sure that we have enough time in class to do quite a bit of practice. All right, so what we're talking about today is we are starting our new unit, Properties of Polynomials. Now, please, please, please follow along with your notes as we do this together here. Now, a polynomial is a function, any function of the form f of x equals a times x to the nth power. And the big thing with this is that x is always going to be an integer. And for this, it's an integer that is actually greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1. So that means that I can have any integer power that I'd like. And as long as that number is positive, because negative ends up actually being a reciprocal function, we can consider that a polynomial. So if you look at all of your variables in a function, are all of your variables just straight up normal, no in a denominator, no in a square root or any other random fraction, just a variable to a power? And if so, it can be considered a polynomial. A simple polynomial is actually where it is x to the zero power. So if I think about this as f of x equals a constant, because zero, x to the zero power, anything to the zero power is just one. So we just have the constant number in front of it. That is going to be a horizontal line. Nice little thing to kind of remember if you've forgotten. I don't know if you've ever heard of poi and vux. A horizontal line has zero slope and it's y equals, whereas a vertical line is undefined and it's x equals to write the equation. Our next basic polynomial is a linear function. Linears are very straightforward. Basically just have x to the first power, so f of x is equal to x. Again, these are the parent functions, so we can do a lot of transformations with this, but in general, this is what we're talking about here. So if we look at the dis difference between these, a constant has no slope. A linear has a very nice slope, and that slope is not going to change as you go through it. Another one of the uh, parent functions that we had from the last unit was the quadratic, which was when we had x squared. And so if we're looking at here, we're just going through positive integer exponents. So for the function f of x equal to x squared, we know that my quadratic is my parabola that opens up. We also had another parent function that we did with the last unit, which was cubic. So in that case, the power on x is 3. And when we graph a cubic function, this is the function that went like that. If you kind of look at what we've done so far, my constant function, this one right here, has no real critical points, no one point that kind of locks everything in, except for what you might consider the y-intercept to be. Same with the linear. We can talk about starting a linear from the y-intercept. Same thing with a quadratic, but when we're talking about a quadratic, we have a minimum or a maximum depending upon our function. The cubic, its critical point is neither a minimum nor a maximum, you remember this is called my point of inflection. Now what happens after the cube root is really interesting. If I move on and let's do the quartic, think about a quarter. Quartic means x to the fourth power. So f of x is x to the fourth power. It actually looks a lot like the quadratic, but it's going to do what I call hug the axis a little bit closer. So basically the quartic is what happens if I kind of pull this guy without moving those arms down closer to the axis. And then we have quintic. If you've ever heard of quintuplets, quintic is where we have five of something. So this is x to the fifth 
And for x to the fifth power, it's going to look a lot like the cubic, but it's going to hug the axis a little bit more. So cortex, again, they had maxes or mins, depending upon what type of an orientation we had. And quintix also have a point of inflection. Now, there's a couple of really cool things that we can see with our properties of polynomials. And if you kind of start from the power of one, from this guy, you see that one goes left and right, down to up, and it goes straight through, up and up, cubic, down and up, Quart uh, quartic, up and up, quintic, down and up. So if you think about those end behaviors, the end behaviors actually alternate. So those are our power functions. So a power function is just the most basic of all of these where we have a constant times a variable to a power. A polynomial function is what we have when we start combining all of our different powers. So a polynomial function is anything in the form of f of x is equal to a x to the n, and I'm just going to call that a to the n x to the n, plus a to the n minus 1 x to the n minus 1. And basically, this is going to go all the way down. And that little subnotation is just saying, okay, I am the a that goes with the x squared. I am the a that goes with the x, and I am the a that is just the constant. So a polynomial function is a function where the only variables that you see throughout it are being raised to an integer power. You don't have any square roots over the x. You could have a square root in the problem, but not over the x. Same thing with the cube root or absolute value. The only operation being done to the x directly is the power. So we've talked about a couple of our different power functions. A polynomial is what we get when we put those together. Continuity. And we've talked a little bit about continuity in the last unit where we were saying continuous things is where I don't have to pick up my pen in order to draw. But continuous are polynomial functions with no holes. or jumps, holes, jumps, or asymptotes. Okay, very simply, you have no discontinuities. So a continuous function can look really, really ridiculous. See, there's my continuous function. Something that I draw without picking up my pen versus a non-continuous function could be something like this where I have a hole in that graph. So that is discontinuous, just as we saw before. Oops, no, no arrow there. I could have a jump like that. Or as we saw in the previous function, and what we did in the last class, I can have what are called asymptotes. That is a non-continuous function. Polynomials are also smooths, uh, smooth functions. Smooth functions mean that you have no sharp turns what we also called So that means, again, a nice Smooth function, continuous, no strange things going on, no sharp turns or cusps means exactly like this. Absolute value, that has a turn. A cusp is like a sharp turn, they look a little bit different. A cusp is kind of a sharp turn with 
a little bit of kind of curviness in it. So that right there is a cusp. So in other words, polynomials are nice functions. Just real simple, cusp. real simple, no weird things going on. And again, the only variable that I have, the only variables that show up always have positive integer exponents and one or zero work for that also. And you can kind of come back and look at these and you will see that all of those are smooth don't need to pick up my pen in order to draw them. They do not have cusps or sharp terms. They do have points of inflection sometimes. They'll have minimums and maximums, but not sharp turns or cusps. Now, something I was trying to point out to you before was looking at those end behaviors. When I had a power of one, I went up on the right, down on the left. Power of two, they matched. Power of three, they were opposite. Power of four, they matched. Power of five, they were opposite. And that takes us to our rules of end behavior. And really what we think about with this is two different things. We think about whether the power is even or odd, and we think about the very first coefficient. And by the coefficient, I mean the leading coefficient. So the coefficient is the number in front of the x with the highest power. Okay. Now for all of these, we'll set the powers aside for a second and we'll just talk about the coefficients. If my coefficient is positive, it doesn't matter if it's even or odd. If the coefficient is positive, that, num that number in the front, so that would end up with the graph that ends going up. If my coefficient is negative, remember that's like a negative multiplier in front of my entire function. If the function is negative, on the right, I end going down. So these are some things that I can tell without even looking at a graph. I know what the end behavior is going to be based off of the coefficient. And again, the coefficient would be something like if I gave you f of x is equal to six, x squared minus three x plus four. That is a positive number. An example for a negative coefficient with an even power is if I were to do even the exact same thing, 5x uh, squared plus 2x plus 1. But if that first number out in front is negative, then I know that my graph is going to end going down. And when I talk about the power, I'm talking about the highest power on x, the degree. If the degree is even, then your end behaviors will match on both sides. It means if it goes up on the right, it's going to go up on the left. For an even power, both ends match down on the right, down on the left. If I have an odd power, so maybe this is something like f of x equals 2x cubed minus x plus 1. If I have an odd power, so that's that guy, but a positive coefficient, that's that one right there, the power is going to determine if beginning and end behavior match. Odd doesn't match. Something is odd when it doesn't quite match up. So that means it's going to go opposite. If I have odd power, like that, an odd power but with a negative coefficient, negative tells me I end going down, the power tells me that I'm going in opposite directions. And all sorts of different things can happen between them.
So again, to run through that, if you have a positive coefficient, your graph ends going up. If you have a negative coefficient, your graph ends going down. If your power is even, then both the first and the last arrows should match direction. If your power is odd, then the beginning and the end directions are the opposite. And so if we think about this, we can kind of turn this into our limit language. So if I do that up here, as x goes to negative infinity, f of x goes to positive infinity. So we would say the limit as x goes to negative infinity is going to be positive, and the limit of f of x as x goes to positive infinity is positive infinity. They are the same. If I look at the next one, the limit as x goes to negative infinity and the limit as x goes to positive infinity, again, we have an even power. Those things have to match. So this is going to be negative infinity, running out of room, and negative infinity. One of the things that I like to do is I like to just kind of think about what kind of an impression you walk away with, what it would be. If I am negative about anything in life, that usually means the last thing that you remember was something that probably wasn't very So if my power is negative, my end behavior to the right, goes down. If I'm positive, that means the last thing you remember is a good thing. It goes up. The right side is the last thing that happens. Now, odd, odd powers are always going to start and end going in the opposite directions. So if it ends up, it's going to start up going down. If it ends down, it starts going up. So for your limit language, as f of x goes to infinity, you're going to look at the coefficient. If the coefficient is positive, it goes to positive infinity. If the coefficient is negative, it goes to negative infinity. Whereas to start, you're going to look at the power. If your power is even, then it's going to be the same as whatever it ends with. If your power is odd, it's going to be the opposite of whatever you end with. And that's talking about your limit language, your end behaviors. So again, basically checking to see if it's positive, it ends on the right going up. If it's negative, it ends on the right going down. If it's even, start and end are the same. If it's odd, start and end are the opposite. And please don't forget, guys, we will be going over this in class, so I'm not expecting you to be 100% with this. It's going to be a lot easier when we start practicing. When we're talking about a root, if you remember, we had another word for a root that we talked about before, and that is a zero or an x-intercept. And what that means is if f is a polynomial function, remember polynomial is simple, x only has powers on it, nothing strange, always positive integer powers. And r is a real number, and when I put r into my function, I get zero out, then r is called a root or a zero.
And remember, a root is your x-intercept. All of those are the same. If r is a real 0 of f, and if I say that, if I say r is a real 0 of f, that's this thing right here. If I put r in, I get 0 out. Then r0, that coordinate, is an x-intercept for a root of the curve. And x minus r is a factor, which means, yes, we are going to be doing much factoring. So factors, roots, intercepts, zeros are all linked together. And we even have links that tie with something called the multiplicity. And a multiplicity is what happens when you have the same more than once. For example, if I have something like x minus 1 squared, that is a multiplicity of 2. It has that root two different times. The zeros obtained from that factors are going to be a multiple zero. So it's not like it actually shows up twice on the graph, but the way it looks on the graph is going to based off of its multiplicity. If the multiplicity is odd, and that would be something like 1, 3, 5, any of those. If the multiplicity is odd, then it's going to pass through the x-axis. R0. It's going to cross straight through. If R has a multiplicity that is even, and that would be, for example, you know what even numbers are, 2, 4, 6, any of those, then what it's going to do is it's going to bounce off, sometimes they call it kiss, the x-axis. at R0. When I say pass through, I mean just that. I mean, if I'm looking at the axis, passing through means it's going to go through the axis, something like that. It can also be a point of inflection like that. A multiplicity that's even is going to pass through that axis or not pass through that axis. It's going to bounce off. It can kind of hug it for a long period of time, or it can bounce straight off. But that's the difference between an odd and an even multiplicity. And then we have this one little thing that kind of follows into that. A polynomial of degree n will have at most n minus 1 turning points. Let's think about that. If I had n equal 1, that's just y equals x. If I have n equals 2, n equals 3, those are our turning points. So the turning point is this guy. n equals 2, I have one turning point. n equals 3, that also has one turning point. Or I can exaggerate it and have two turning points. That's what that theorem is going to say. So that's going to occur at local maximum or local minimums. And I really should add points of inflection in there. Because a point of inflection is not necessarily changing whether your graph is opening down or opening up. It's changing the concavity of your graph. All right, let's just do a couple here. We're going to put all of this together. And again, we will practice this in depth in class. If I give you a factored function that says x squared times x minus 3 times x plus 4, using that, you should know what my x-intercepts are going to be. If x squared is a factor, then 0 is an intercept. If x minus 3 is a factor, well, that means positive 3 will be an intercept. 
And if x plus 4 is a factor, well, that means that negative 4 is going to be an intercept. So if I were to plot those points, I have a point at 0, I have a point at 3, and I have a point at negative 4. All of that I know is true. If I were to talk about end behavior, I can do that by simply looking at all of my x's. If I were to multiply those together, x squared times x times x, that would be x to the fourth. So that is an even power. It's a positive one out in front. So that means it's going to end on the right going up. Four is even, so on the left, it needs to be doing the same thing. All of this I'm getting from just looking at the factors. Let's go back to those factors. Let's talk about the multiplicity. Zero came from that piece. It has a power of two, so multiplicity of two. Since the multiplicity is even, it's just going to touch or kind of bounce off the axis at that point. On x minus three, it doesn't have any extra powers, so the multiplicity is one. So I should cross the axis at that point. And at negative four, again, no power, so that means my multiplicity is 1. So again, that is where I'm going to cross. It's easier to start talking about this when you're dealing with your ends. I know I have to end going up on the left and the right. I also know at 3 and negative 4, I'm supposed to cross through the graph. Let me make that a little bit straighter. And since the multiplicity is 1, it should go through there pretty straight. But I need to get it to bounce off at 2. I'm sorry, at 0. Because that has a multiplicity of 2. So if I kind of come back over here, the interval, interval above the x-axis, my positive intervals, will go from negative infinity to negative 4, and from 3 to positive infinity. I'm using parentheses there because at 4 I'm on the x-axis, so I'm not above or below it. The interval below the x-axis would go from negative 4 to 0, and from 0 to 3. Again, not including 0 because that one is on the axis. How do you find a y-intercept? To find a y-intercept, put a 0 in for x and solve. So if I put a 0 in for x, that's 0 squared minus 3 plus 4. 0 times anything is 0, so my y-intercept, and you see it's what we had drawn already, is 0, 0. And the degree was when I multiplied all of those together, so the degree was 4. It's a fourth degree polynomial. Positive end behavior. Try one more. Remember, we're just trying to get the basic idea here. We have our intercepts. Each of these play a role in intercepts, multiplicities, cross-touch. So start with those. Negative x squared, basically what we're doing is we're setting each of these equal to zero and solving. So for the first one, negative x squared equals zero is going to happen when x is zero. And that power is squared, so it has a multiplicity of two. If the multiplicity is 2, it should just touch the axis, not cross it. 
Did you catch what happened on the next one? X squared minus nine. X squared minus 9 isn't being done being factored yet. <coughs> so I have to factor that further. This guy actually factors to x minus 3, x plus 3. So rather than having just one x intercept with that, I'm actually going to have two. So I have an x intercept at positive 3 and negative 3. Both of those with a multiplicity of 1. So both of those cross the axis at that spot. And then for the last one, for 6x plus the uh, 6x, oh, that should be 6 minus x. If I were to solve the last one, 6 minus x equal to 0, x minus 6, you get that x is 6. The power on that is 2, so that would touch. Let's plot those. I have negative 3, 0, 3, and 6. What's the degree of this? It's a little bit trickier here. Take a look at all of your x's. I have negative x squared times x squared times... But that's not just x, that's x squared. So when I multiply all of those out, I would have negative x to the sixth as my first term, which means this is a sixth degree polynomial. It's a sixth degree polynomial where the coefficient is negative, so then I start going down to the right. Whoops, that's, that's pointing up, but it's supposed to be pointing down. The power is even, so I should be doing the same thing on both ends. Now go through working your way out to n. So if I look at negative 3, negative 3, I should cross the axis. If I look at 6, at 6, I should just touch the axis and bounce off. At zero, I should touch the axis and bounce off. And they should match up with at three crossing in the middle. And that means my intervals above the x-axis are going to go from negative three to zero, from zero to three, and that's it. The intervals below the axis will go from negative infinity to negative 3. I pick up below the x-axis from 3 to 6. And again, from 6 to infinity. How do I find the x-intercept? Well, for the x-intercept, you put a 0 for y and solve. So that would be 0 squared minus 9 minus 6 squared. So you've got to do this work. But hey, this is really nice. I've got another 0 here. I don't have to do well, 6 is 36 times negative 9. I don't need to do that because 0 times anything is 0. And we can see on my graph that that's exactly how it worked out. Again, much practice with this in class. There's one more concept that I want to talk about with you guys, and that is polynomial division. And this is why it's important for you guys to understand how to do long division by hand with just numbers. Because I actually think it's a lot easier to do long division with powers. But some key ideas for this is to make sure you go from that your function, your polynomial, is in standard form. Standard form means highest power starts, and then you go all the way down to the constant. The biggest thing with this is if you are missing a power,
For example, you go from x cubed to x. You need to put a placeholder in. And I do believe we'll see some things like that. So if I give you something like x cubed minus 1, if we're going to be doing division, whatever kind of division it is, you need to rewrite that as x cubed, no x squared, no x, and then minus 1. If I just give you x to the fourth minus x squared, you would need to rewrite that as x to the fourth, no x cubed, minus x squared, no x, and no constant. You have to work your way all the way down. So make sure that you have placeholders wherever you're dealing with this. And I'm going to divide that into the other function. And if I need multipliers, if I need placeholders, I can put them in, not multipliers, placeholders. So four, three, two, one, no x. So I didn't need any placeholders. Working this through is actually quite simple. You're just going to look at this term, the very first ones and the very first one. Don't let everything else scare you. It's going to be okay. You want to ask yourself, x squared times what? is x to the fourth. Well, I need an x squared there. x squared times x squared gives me x to the fourth. So I will put that x squared on top of my other x squared, keeping it nice and lined up. Then what I'm going to do, I'm trying to erase this yellow, it's not letting me. Is I'm going to take that x squared and I need to distribute it to each of these pieces. That placeholder is going to make sure we don't accidentally forget something or put it in the wrong spot. x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. I'll have 0x cubed. I'll have 8x squared. In long division, your next step is to subtract. Problem with that is a lot of people forget to distribute. So what I say is the next step is to change all of your signs. And then combine. And just like we'd hoped, this x to the fourth cancels out. I'm left with 3x cubed. 4 minus 8 is negative 4x squared. And I bring down the 24. Looking at the next piece. Again, I don't need to look at the entire thing. I just need to focus on the first term. x squared times what gives me 3x to the third? I need a 3x, a positive 3x. So I take that positive 3x, and now I distribute again. That's going to give me 3x to the third, no x squares, and then that is going to be 24x. Again, immediately go through and change all of your signs. So now I have negative 4x squared. That's no x. And I bring down the negative 32. And now, instead of thinking about seeing that term that we did before, we're going to take the same approach. We're going to look at this term here. x squared times what gives me negative 4x squared? Well, we need a negative 4. And when I multiply through, it's negative 4x squared, no x, minus 32. And when I change all of my signs, I end up with no remainder. So that means my final answer is that stuff on top. x squared plus 3x minus 4.
Let me show you that one more time. You need to take the divisor and put it out front. Check to make sure you don't need any placeholders. Then you put the rest of the problem in here. Four, three, two, one, no X. And make sure they're in order. Make sure you have placeholders if you need. Only for focus on the first terms. From X squared to X to the fourth, I need X squared. Line it up. Distribute. Watch your powers. Change your signs. Combine. Drop it down. Do it again. To get from x squared to negative 4x cubed, I need negative 4x. Multiply. Watch your signs. Watch your powers. Subtract by changing all of your signs. That'll leave me with 2x squared, no x, minus 10. Check it again. From x squared to 2x squared, I need a 2. Multiply. Subtract, changing all of your signs. Interesting. We get 2x left over. That 2x is my remainder. There's should be written as that number over what you were trying to divide by. So your answer is x squared minus 4x plus 2 plus, and then take that remainder over what you were dividing by. Okay, and one more division. And I, I know this is a lot, guys. Don't worry, though, we're going to be doing a lot of practice. We're going to be okay. Again, with synthetic division, what we can only use synthetic division by is if you, if you want to divide by a linear binomial. That means I want to divide by something like AX plus B. You want to divide by a linear binomial. Take the divider, equal it to zero, and solve. So that means that I'm going to have X is neg negative A, I'm sorry, negative B over A. You're going to need that number. You want to make sure, just like before, set it up in standard form with placeholders. Okay, I love this. This is really kind of cool. Watch this. So I've got a linear binomial. Check. Set the divider equal to zero and solve. So that would mean I would have x equals three. Set it up in standard form with placeholders. Check your powers. Three, two, one, no power, we're good to go. And this is how synthetic division is done. You make kind of like a little box, an upside down division sign. 
you are only going to take the coefficients and the coefficients include the signs that are attached to them. And you're going to write those down. 4, negative 16, 20, negative 16. And under the very last number, you're going to put a box. This is going to be your remainder box. I take this number and put it right here. To do synthetic division, you drop, multiply, subtract, multiply, subtract, and you keep going. So what do I mean by that? I mean drop, multiply, I'm sorry, let's add. Add, that's going to give me negative 16 and 12 is going to be giving me negative 4. Multiply. Add. Multiply. Add. And all you need to do is whatever your power was here, go down one. So 4x cubed, that becomes x squared. That becomes x, and that becomes no x, and that's my remainder. So I get 4x squared minus 4x plus 8, and then 8 over x minus 3 is my remainder. Let me do that one more time with you guys. Take this last piece, set it equal to zero and solve. That number goes here. Take all of your coefficients. But remember, in standard form, you need placeholders. So in front of my x cubed, I have one. I don't have an x squared term. Then I have minus 49x and plus 120. That last number is going to be your remainder box. We just drop, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, Do I have a long sign in here? Eight, eight, multiply, there we go, and add. Take the highest power, go down one. X squared, X, no X, remainder. So I'm left with X squared minus 8X plus 15. And that is synthetic division. I'm just going to finish it up with this little last little idea and we'll just save the problems for in class. So you can completely factor a polynomial by dividing the function by a known factor. So if I know that I have a factor, and we're going to call it x minus r. If I know I have a factor, then the zero is going, then the, I'm sorry, if I divide it by it, then the remainder is going to be zero. If it's a factor, it divides in evenly. And that kind of translates to, if I have a polynomial f of x, r is going to be a factor of x if and only f, f of r equals zero. And I just realized how much information I threw at you guys, so I appreciate you sticking with me with that, and I will call it quits here, and we will go over this together in class. Thank you for your patience.